This happened not too long ago. It's kind of embarrassing to talk about really, but it will probably come out in the news anyways, so I guess I should tell my side before the media makes a field day of it. I can see the headlines now. 26 year old virgin gets abducted by the only girl he's ever talked to. Alright, they'll probably have more class than that, but anyone who can read between the lines will see it. I'm a bit of a weeaboo. There, I admitted it. I was at an anime con. And in cosplay. I went as All Might for My Hero Academia, if you need to know. It was right around the Death Note booth. I turned from a heated discussion about Elle when I bumped into her. She was amazing. Cute little ears and a perfectly painted nose. Her whiskers were so realistic, and that tail. I fell for her as soon as she said, Excuse me, ow, and started to clean herself with her paws. I said sorry, and then introduced myself. How I had the courage to speak at all is beyond me, but I did. She said something else, and it was funny. We laughed. When I turned to walk away, she began to follow me. It was subtle at first, but I finally figured it out. Every time I turned back, she was staring at me. It should have creeped me out, yet it didn't. I had never had that kind of attention from anyone before, and it was flattering. She would give this cute little wave with her paws and meow or purr at me. So damn adorable. I finally said, come here kitty, and she skipped up to me. We spent the day looking at mangas and talking about this lore and that. She said her name was Chi. I assumed she was using a fake name because that's a character from Chobits. It didn't matter though. She was cute and fun and playful and perfect, or so I thought. We stayed together until the convention closed down that day. Before we parted ways, I gave her my phone number and she gave me the silver bell she wore on her collar. I didn't know it at the time, but she was essentially giving me her calling card. I waited for weeks for a phone call from her, but I wasn't surprised when it never came. In fact, it was so long afterwards that we would meet again, I almost forgot about her. It was months later, when I was coming out of a grocery store, that I noticed something odd on my car's windshield wiper. It was a little silver bell. I looked around and couldn't find a trace of who had left it. I knew though, because I had an identical one at home. A few days later, I found another one in my mailbox, then one on my desk at work, and finally one on my bed at home. Yeah, I was freaked out. Someone had come into my parents' house all the way downstairs and left a silver bell on my pillow. I was turning it in my hands when there was a knock on the door. My mom yelled out that there was a package for me, so I went to go get it. She asked me who it was from, but there was no return address on it. I made something up and told her it was from one of my fan club groups. She quickly lost interest at that, which allowed me to take it downstairs and open it in peace. Inside the box, there were hundreds of silver bells just like the ones I had been finding. What made this different though, was at the bottom, there was a dead mouse. It looked like it had had its throat cut. Truly disturbing stuff. I didn't know what to tell people. I figured they'd all laugh at me or make fun of me or not believe me at all. So I did what anyone would do. I buried the mouse and threw out all the bells I had gotten. I now realize I had just destroyed a lot of evidence. But understand, I was freaking out and not thinking clearly. The next day I began to receive phone calls. One at first, then a few days later, almost one every hour. No one would talk on the other end. It would be meowing or soft purrs for like five minutes straight, then they'd hang up. The number only showed up as private. I began to let them go to voicemail. It continued for about a week. On the last day I had over 200 messages of things like this. Finally they just stopped. A week after the last phone call I received a letter. Again, it had no return address. Quickly, I took it downstairs before my mom even noticed I had gotten anything. In the privacy of my own room, with only my Spike Spiegel and Fist of the North Star posters to witness, I opened the letter. I screamed. Inside was a picture of a girl in a cat suit. Her face was hidden behind her two paws, but it was what was at the end of those paws that startled me. They had claws for sure. 
It's just that they looked like some kind of Freddy Krueger adaptation. Long knives extended from her fingers covered in fur. On the back, she had written, You will be with Meow forever, Senpai. Again, I did what any rational person would do. I burnt the picture. In my mind, if it didn't exist, then it didn't happen. Makes sense, right? By this time, I really needed a drink. So I headed to the bar to forget all of this. Probably put back more white claws than I should have, but you know how it is. After the first one, they're so damn smooth. Anyways, at some point, a woman sat down next to me, and for the second time in my life, she began to talk to me. Remember, I had never seen Chi out of her costume before, so I didn't know what she really looked like. We talked for a bit, and she encouraged me to drink with some silly game she had made up. It worked, and by the time I was ready to leave, which was probably about five drinks too late, I could barely stand. She offered to walk me outside and wait with me for a cab. We must have been out there for about 10 minutes before I finally slurred out the question of whether she had actually called a cab or not. That's when she licked the back of her hand and began to clean herself with it. I tried to run, I really did, but I didn't get more than two steps before I fell over. I was in and out of consciousness, but I vaguely remember being dragged by my arms around to the back of the bar, lifted into the back seat of her car, and driven off. When I finally came to, I was on a hard bed in a bleak room with holes in the wall. I tried to move, and the cold bite of metal cut into all four of my limbs. She had me handcuffed. Once my vision came into focus, I let out a blood-curdling scream. In the corner of the room, there were some lit candles, what appeared to be a statue made out of raw ground beef, and hundreds of pictures of me. Some were me with my friends. Some were of me at work, and a few were of me, on my bed, at home. The scream brought Chi into the room. She took one look at me and then went back out. She returned a few minutes later with a mouse in her mouth and a saucer of milk. Still completely silent, she slinked onto the bed one-handed, laid the dead mouse on my chest and curled up next to me so our heads were next to each other. She took a few licks of the milk, stopped to look at me, and kind of motioned with her eyes down to the saucer. She then continued to lap it up for a bit, look at me, motion with her eyes, and lap again. Finally, I took the hint, and with tears streaming down my face and a soft sobbing from my throat, I began to lap the milk with her. This made her purr in a most frightening manner. Once we had finished, she began to lick off any cream that had spilled into my chin. After that, she bathed my hair with her tongue until she thought I was clean enough, then left, all without saying a word. No, she didn't remove the dead mouse. It laid there on my chest all night until she came back. This went on for a while. Three times a day she would come in, dead mouse in her mouth and a saucer in her hands. She'd clean me, then leave. On the last day, I had a very large pile of dead and decaying mice surrounding me. Finally, though, she cleaned them up. She then wheeled in a television on a stand. For six hours we laid there, cuddled up, watching her favorite anime shows. By this point, I was so delirious with dehydration and malnutrition that I didn't really know what was going on. At some time, she had uncuffed one of my hands and laid it around her shoulders. I don't know much of what happened next. I just remember a moment of clarity after she had left for the night. She hadn't put my free hand back in the restraint. Whether she thought we had finally connected, or I was too weak to escape, or she plain forgot. For a brief second, things made sense again, and I knew what I had to do. The bed frame I was on was one of those cheap aluminum types, the ones with all the bars underneath to distribute the weight so they can actually hold something up. With my free hand, I began to move the mattress out from under me, just enough so I could get to the bars. Once I could do that, I began to break the bed apart one bar at a time. Once the frame lost most of its structure, I could bend and twist the larger outer bars. Finally, I got enough of the frame loose to where I could move more freely and stand up. I was still attached to some of the frame though, so that had to come with me. One arm was in the air and both legs couldn't do more than shuffle, but it was enough. Slowly, agonizingly slowly, 
I made my way out of the room, being careful to duck through the door so my arm wouldn't hit the doorframe above. Fortunately, I was on the ground floor. No way I could have made it downstairs the way I was. I would have had to fall down them. To make a long story short, I managed to get out without any incident. She had been out at work when I made my escape. I called the police and told them my story. They searched her place, and what they found still gives me nightmares. In her basement, there were the skeletal remains of five missing persons. They were all able to be ID'd. One of them was recently deceased. He had bite marks on his throat and claw marks all down his abdomen. The cause of death was disembowelment. Seems like she had been doing this for a while and just got a little sloppy with me. Her MO appears to be that she is super nice at first, but then she turns obsessed with her targets. She makes this whole scenario up in her head about a life with them. Once they're too weak to give her the life she wants, she gets rid of them and finds another victim. So when you hear in the papers about this anime nerd and how he fell for the only girl that he had ever talked to, how he destroyed evidence and didn't contact the authorities when he should have, go ahead, snicker and laugh all you like. Just know that I had my reasons and I've learned a huge life lesson out of all of this. This happened in my freshman year of college. I was a 19 year old woman at the time, and he was just some quiet kid. Some quiet kid that went to my college. His name was Henry. We had a few classes together and I had seen him around often. He was always by himself. I felt sort of sad for him really. It looked like he didn't have any friends at all. I would see him at lunch by himself playing on his phone or something. One time when I left class to use the woman's room, I found him in the hallway talking to a small stuffed animal. He was telling it a joke that made it laugh in this really creepy kind of laugh. I didn't know what to think so I lowered my head and walked on by. His face turned bright red and he stuffed the teddy back into his backpack. When I came back out, he was gone. At the time, I didn't think anything of seeing him around all the time. It's a pretty small liberal arts college I went to. There weren't many places to go in between classes. That was until the time I found him behind a building crying. I was taking my latest painting out to hit it with some clear coat, and he was sitting behind a tree with tears in his eyes. I couldn't leave him there crying. I knew something was up with him. He jumped a bit when I said hi, but we settled down afterwards and we had a pretty normal conversation. He had been getting harassed by some guys he used to know in high school that ended up in the same college. They were vicious judging by his accounts. I listened and reassured him it will get better. Then I gave him the number for the school psychologist. Nothing really special. After that, I started to notice him even more. Not only in the same area as me, but closer. When I was at lunch with my friends, he would sit at the table next to us all by himself. It was sad, so I invited him over. He had no social understanding at all. He'd either be dead silent or say off the wall things unsure of how to join a conversation. For example, if we were talking about the next exam that was coming up, he would say, yeah, but have any of you seen a squirrel die before? Like what the hell does that even have to do with the exam except for being super creepy? Very quickly my friends would leave whenever he came around which left us alone. I tried to talk to him about it. He would get really upset and down so I dropped it. Even after being invited to the table, he would do the same thing everywhere. Out in the quad he'd stand really close until he got invited. Or even in the hall the same thing, like he needed an invitation every time. Soon I started seeing him off campus as well, at the mall, the movie theater, even out to eat. I stopped inviting him over, it didn't help. He would stand or sit there the whole time and leave when we left. I live on the ground floor of the dorms, and some nights I would hear something rubbing against my window. When I checked, there was nothing there, but the branches on the bush in front of the window would be moving. Some nights it might have been the wind, but other nights there was no breeze at all. One night, my roommate came back late from her date. As soon as she got in the room, she ran over to my side and threw the curtains closed. She said that when the headlights went across the building, 
she saw some guy in the bushes looking in the window. If that wasn't bad enough, there were multiple reports of some guy that was rooting around in our dorm's dumpsters at night as well. It didn't take a genius to figure out who that was. Everything pointed to Henry. This went on for a while. No one had anything solid against him though, so we couldn't do anything. That was until I came home from a party one night. Some guy there was being a real jerk and tried to get handsy. I wasn't into it at all. I told him no, but he was persistent. Finally, one of my guy friends heard what was happening. It got bad. First, they were verbal. Then they got physical. My friend ended up punching the other guy in the nose. That was enough for one night for me, and I left. It wasn't a far walk. I thought nothing of it. I was about to my dorm when Henry popped out of nowhere. He started to talk about how nice the night was. I think I said something like, get lost? That's when he started to get mad. He said that was no way for his girlfriend to treat him. That I'm a horrible girlfriend, and it was like I didn't even love him. What the hell, I thought. We weren't even friends, let alone a couple, and that's what I said to him. He then went off that we had to be a couple because he knows so much about me and began to list off things like the side of the bed I sleep on, the kinds of snacks I like, the shows I watch, even my clothing size. It was so bad. I told him to call the number for the counselor I'd given him because he needed help. That's when he tried to grab me for a hug. We struggled for a bit, and he called me names I won't repeat before he slapped me in the face. There was a look of shock and disbelief on him. Then he broke into tears and ran away. Honestly, this is probably the worst stalker story you've ever heard because he stopped coming around and eventually dropped out of school and moved away. Some part of me still hates him for being a creep, but another part of me hopes he got some help. Worked with this guy, Kevin, at a summer job one time. I was 18, just a young girl out of high school and kind of naive. We worked at an amusement park. It was a small one, but since there wasn't much else to do in that town, it was always busy. Started off with him staring at me while we worked. I was at the petting zoo and he was at the dinky roller coaster across the way. Every time I looked over, he would be staring right at me, no mistaking it. I don't know if he was trying to be seductive or what, but it wasn't working. He asked me out a couple of times, but I always said no because of his weird vibe. Cut to a house party near the end of summer. Ends up he's at the same party as me. He continues to give me creepy stares and follows me at a distance around the place. I got weirded out and left in my car. And just to let you know, the house we were at was a large one out in the woods. Lots of the wealthier people in our town lived out on the properties around there. Most of them owned a couple of acres or so. Anyways, I was driving the long roads back to town by myself. I know there was no one behind me since I never saw lights approaching. No, they weren't hidden by the trees. They're pretty spaced out and besides, it's a long straight road. Suddenly lights flashed on behind me, which means he was driving with them off for a while. The car behind me speeds up and gets so close his lights are blinding me from the reflection in the mirrors. I did my best to stay on the road. The other car would speed up and slow down, then speed up and slow down. He was toying with me. Here's the problem. I couldn't get out of my car, but I also couldn't go home. I wasn't even sure if it was Kevin following me, but I had a strong suspicion. And here's where my naivety shows. I didn't know that I could have called the police for something like this. It was outright harassment and stalking, especially with his behavior at the party. Nothing changed once we hit town. He followed me the whole way around the place. Even when I thought I lost him, he'd meet me on a side street or something. If I didn't know better, I would have thought that he had a tracker on my car. You might ask yourself why I didn't stop somewhere public and get help. It was after midnight, and in a small town that means everywhere was closed. That was, until about after two hours of this, I remembered that the gas station on 34th and Main was 24 hours, and not just the pumps. He must have figured out what I was doing because he came across a side street and stopped in the middle of my path. I turned around to go a different way, but he did the same thing. Finally, I faked going one way, 
and when his view was blocked by a building, I made a U-turn and double-backed. My gas gauge was on empty by this point, so if I didn't make it, well, I don't want to think about what would have happened. He must have figured it out, but by that time I was too far ahead. He sped up to try and catch me. I screeched into the parking lot, didn't even turn off my car and got out. I was at the door, about to open it when he pulled up. He rolled down his window, spat at me, then called me a bitch before burning out of there. I got inside and was in tears. The clerk asked me what had happened and I told him. He encouraged me to call the police, which I did. Kevin was arrested the next day. And that was by far the scariest thing I have ever gone through. I work at a pretty big law firm, which makes what happened even more unusual. For some clarification, I'm a 32-year-old female who at one time had a promising career in case law, fast track for partnership and all that. It's a pretty competitive place as you could imagine. It's not unheard of for people to sabotage each other. But for the most part, we're a pretty tight team and petty differences get squashed early. I had recently gotten a promotion to non-equity partner with the option to buy in in a year or two depending on how things went. Everyone in my office was happy for me. They got me a cake, cards, it was a nice little party. About a week after that, I got a strange letter through the mail department. There was no return address on it and it seems sort of cliche, but the words were made up of cut out letters from magazines. It said, you betrayed me. I didn't call the police immediately. There was no threat or anything. It was just creepy. I didn't even know what it was talking about. I hadn't done anything to anyone and shrugged it off as some weird practical joke. I did save it, however, just in case more came in and then I would have a trail of evidence. Well, it didn't take long. A couple of days later, another one came in. This one was more disturbing in its tone and message. It said, you took what was mine, you will pay. Again, it was in words that were cut out from magazines. This was a cause for concern. I called the police and reported the letters. They came by later that day and took them in as evidence. Of course, there were no fingerprints. All the letters were cut out from different magazines, so that limited the chance to find out where they were purchased, and no DNA was found on the back of the envelope. Later that night, after long hours at the office, I left about 10 p.m. While I was walking through the parking garage to my car, I heard strange sounds coming from behind me. Sort of a rhythmic tapping on the concrete of what sounded like a metal pipe. It came closer and closer. I broke into a run. After having received those letters, I was naturally scared. Five feet from my car, I unlocked the doors using the key fob. I took only one look back. In that brief instant, a car came around the corner. A large pipe flew from the driver's side window and smashed into the back window of my vehicle. Then the other car sped out of sight. I didn't get a good description of the car, nor did I see the license plate. In fact, I don't think it had any on. All I knew was that the car was a black sedan of some sort. Again, the police were called. No prints, no DNA. The rubber from the tires were a general brand widely purchased and impossible to track down. Whoever did this knew police routine and what they were looking for. They were very sure not to give them anything to go on. Following that incident, I took time off for my mental health. My nerves were shot, as one could imagine. It didn't help though. Every knock on my door, bump in the night, or a gust of wind had me on edge. After a while though, I was able to relax. It seemed like whoever was doing this didn't know where I lived, or so I thought. Until a week later, when another envelope came with no return address. Hands shook wildly as I opened it to see what was inside. It was another letter that said, I'm watching you. Inside the envelope, there was a fine white powder. That broke me. I fell down in tears and cried for a good half an hour, then began to drag myself to the shower in hopes of washing off any of the powder that might have gotten onto me. I was in there when my friend Karen came by to check up on me. I must have left the door open after getting my mail because she walked right in. It was her that found me a complete mess in the bathroom. The water had run cold, but I was still there, in the corner of the shower, sobbing. 
She wrapped me in a warm, dry towel and made a cup of tea for me to relax with. Then she picked up the letter and put it in a plastic bag so the rest of the powder wouldn't get all over. Next, she phoned the police for me. They came after two hours. It took a day or so to get results of the powder back, but it was just baking flour you could buy anywhere, mixed with salt and a bit of sugar to make it look more granulated. Again, it was nothing they could trace down. The only prints on the envelope were mine and Karen's. Also, each letter was sent from a different post office, so no way they could track down a location from that. This person had thought of everything. Then the phone calls came. They would ring and when I answered, they'd just hang up. Odd pieces of paper were slipped under my door at night. It was a constant barrage of intimidation. Police were finally posted at my house for a while, which stopped the paper and the calls until they had to leave after a few days. Then they simply started up again. By this time, I had used up all my sick leave. The firm was nice enough to hold my position for me without pay, but that wouldn't last forever either. My whole life was unraveling right before my eyes, and there was nothing I could do about it. My sanity was hanging on by a thread. Being cooped up wasn't helping it at all. So I decided to ask Karen if I could stay at her place for a night or two, just to get a change of scenery. She was single as well, so I didn't think it would be a problem. She balked at it at first, but then finally agreed. I packed a few days clothes, hailed a cab and headed over there. Once there, Karen invited me in. She had a nice place, very spacious, but on her salary, she could have done better. True, she was only a senior associate, still, she wasn't a pauper. She had a condo on the Upper East Side, a place usually reserved for starving artists and the like. It must have been the nicest place on the East Side, but still, it was on the East Side. Anyways, I wasn't there to judge. I was there to relax and forget I was being harassed. She showed me to my room, which wasn't hard to find considering she only had three rooms. Her bedroom, my guest room, and one she said was under renovations. I was expecting a fun girl's night, maybe some wine and conversation. All she did was show me to my room and then excused herself, saying she had to work early in the morning. It might have been for the best. That was the first night in a long time I slept unafraid. The next day when I woke up, she was gone. I sat with a cup of coffee and watched some TV for a while until I got bored, decided to look around the place. I wanted to see what kind of renovations she was doing in that other room. When I went to go look inside of it, I found it was locked. I began to wonder what kind of renovations she was doing in there if no one was coming to work on it. There was no dust mat, no signs of any work being tracked into the place, zero indication of anything happening in there. I know I shouldn't have. It was a huge breach of privacy, but I had to see what was in there. I was so curious to know what wonderful things my friend was doing to her little place on the east side. You know in movies when a person opens a door with a credit card and most people don't think it will work? Well it will depending on the door, especially on older cheap doors, which this was. So using my American Express and a few moments of patience, I was in. My breath caught in my throat once I saw what was in there. There were pictures of me, hung up on the walls. It looked like someone had poked out my eyes with a pencil, and some of them had X's on my face or knife holes through them. The word bitch was written in red sharpie markers all across the walls. In the middle of the room was a large stack of magazines. Initially I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing. The shock overwhelmed me. But then it slowly started to dawn on me and I pulled out my phone and started to take pictures of the evidence. I walked towards a stack of magazines. About halfway there, my phone rang. It was Karen. As casually as I could, I answered the phone with my sweetest, hello? She asked how I was doing and if I was comfortable. I tried to sound normal, but I don't think I was successful because she then asked if she could take me out to lunch. I told her I would just order something in. But she replied that that was nonsense and she'd be by soon to get me. I had to act fast. Without hesitation, I called 911. When the operator answered, I gave them the address twice to make sure they got it and put the phone down. They would have to send a patrol car to investigate. Normal response time for police in the area is 15 minutes, give or take. It would be a race to see who got there sooner, Karen or the cops. I went to the table and paged through the magazines. Sure enough, they had pages missing, 
but there was no evidence that anything had been cut out. There were a few shelving units and cabinets in the room, so I looked through those as well. I found flour, sugar, and salt in one of them, and a large black trash bag in another. I had only minutes left to get any kind of evidence so that the cops could enter the place when they got there. Frantically, I tore the black trash bag open. Bingo. It was full of pages and pages with letters cut from them. I was sure that the notes that the police had would have letters that matched the pages where they were cut from. I turned to leave the room when I was hit with a wave of nausea. The full realization that one of my best friends and teammates had been torturing me for over a month finally sank in. In fact, I threw up right there in the room. I didn't hear the door open when Karen came into her place. She must have known something was up because she came right back to where I was. She had just reached the doorway when a knock was heard at the entrance of her condo. The words, it's the police, were the sweetest words I had ever heard. Karen stood there, frozen. I let out a blood-curdling scream and yelled, help, to give them probable cause to enter without permission. They knocked down the door gangbuster style and rushed in. Of course, they didn't know what was happening, so they questioned the two of us. There was a literal wall of evidence against Karen, and they cuffed her and took her away. What it boils down to was that Karen, who had been at the firm longer than me, was jealous of my promotion. She tried to make me mentally unfit for work so she could take my place. You might think that's ridiculous, but if you have worked in law and seen some of the cases I have, then you might realize it's not the most ridiculous thing ever. In a way, I feel sorry for her, once I work through the feelings of hate and disgust, of course. She didn't need to do that. The firm had been talking about making her the next promotion after me. She didn't know, of course, but all she had to do was wait. Wait.